program is funded by um, the government, GRNZ, and Foundation for Arable Research in partnership with a range of CROIs, so we've all put cash into it. And it's a lot about the research to break the links between production and environment. Because we know historically that as we've intensified our production, we've had a bigger impact on the environment. So this research challenge was to look at how we actually break the links. <laughs> But of course we absolutely understand, and, and those of you who know Bill will know that he continually reminds us that he's still got to be profitable regardless of the hairbrain schemes that we come up with. <laughs> Not that any of our science is hairbrain. So what we just want to do is, is I just want you to stand back so I can watch this. A lot of what we're talking about is about nitrate leaching in the research program that we're starting our presentation with. And what we've set out to do is focus on where we can reduce. So reducing the plant nitrogen content, which results in the animal having a lower nitrogen intake. The animal still, and so we'll talk about it, needs enough nitrogen in its system for growth and reproduction, but we do want less urinary nitrogen landing on the ground. And if we've got a lower concentration, a landing of nitrogen on the ground, we've got a better chance of when it arrives in that soil nitrogen pool that the plants can take it up. And ideally, we want plants taking it up more rapidly and more of it than we have currently. So the research program is about saying, you <coughs> know that this is what goes on every day on your farm and the principles are the same, whether it's a sheep or a cow or, or a beef animal or a dairy animal. The principles are the same. How can we manipulate, through science knowledge, the uptake and the nitrogen cycling in the system? And of course, never forgetting we can do the science, but we've got to address it through the management decisions that Bill and his team made. So that farm management is absolutely key to how this nitrogen cycle works. So, sorry, sorry, Robin, to butt in there, but so this is about opportunities we've got on our farm systems. That last slide is about where we can, a lot of those things we can influence, and that's what we're trying to influence in our the research or the, the work that's being done on our farm and all the monitoring. So why does it matter to you as sheep and beef farmers? Our reality, when we get to the end of the talk today, what we've shown with Bill and Shirley's farm is we only have a modest air losses on that farm. The reality is 64% of New Zealand's farmland is farmed by sheep and beef farmers. So about 9 million hectares is under the stewardship of sheep and beef farmers. Multiply that by even a modest amount of nitrogen, it's still a very large amount of nitrogen. But importantly, in our social licence to farm, let's understand where we sit and how the science might better help us. But we also acknowledge when you think about environmental issues, you're thinking about all of these things. And for many of you, nitrates may be at the bottom of the list. We're going to touch also on greenhouse gases today as we think about a future challenge. Right, over to you, Bill. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and this is on behalf of Shirley and I who... This is a, a shot from the top of our farm looking down the Cannington Basin, which is in South Canterbury, inland Timaru, about 35 k's from Timaru. Um, and we have the Pariora River running through our property um, on the right-hand corner there, and it doesn't always flow. In fact, for about nearly three years it was dry, but it can um, get very extreme. It's a short east coast river and extreme um, flood events as well. So Shirley and I purchased this property in 91, 1991, and then we added a bit more in 2001. We were monitor farmers for meat and wool monitor farms 1996 to 99. So we were right early in our, in our farming careers. Um, this farm was um, bought at the bottom of the farming cycle in price and also in production. It was just a, a, a brown top farm with um, some good infrastructure as in a good wall shed. Um, the house uh, was very old and falling down and um, a lot of the farm didn't, it didn't produce much and you'll see some of that in slides coming through. Um, we had 28% equity as well when we started and um, basically it's, uh, it's, we're, we're low level, two, two to three hundred feet above sea level. Um, so one of the goals we've set on our property is to be innovative and to be profitable and to meet market and environmental challenges. Um, the next slide. So, so since we um, started, we 
dramatically changed our farming system. We used to run about two and a half, 2,400 ewes. I'll get to that actually. But we've, we've, we've dramatically changed our farming system with it, um, a lot of renovation, pasture renovation, and most of that's been done direct drilling. Um, we're summer dry as well, so um, and that's our probably most challenging environment, 600 mil rainfall, uh, 90 day winter. So winters are have always considered a strength. We always knew how to grow crops for the winter and get our stock through the winter. Um, where the photo was taken on the first slide, there's also a weather station there. So at any moment I can go onto my phone and look at the, the weather station and see whether the sun's shining, raining, or surely shifted the stock. And I can do the same. And um, you've always got to be a little careful when you're sitting in your office with the air condition going, you ring up Bill and say, ooh, that looks like a heavy frost I can see at your place this morning. So, but, but all our um, helicopter pilots and um, fertiliser companies, um, spreading companies, use that website. It's actually there for rural fire. We're in the middle of three district councils. Um, but we've also put some other things like soil moisture, soil temperature in there. And it's, um, and it's a pretty good forecaster. So Bill, with those crops, we've got 15 hectares of fodder beet now and 15 hectares of kale. How's that changed even since we, you became our monitor farm four years ago? Uh, four years ago I, we were mainly kale, uh, five years ago probably mainly kale and then we started dabbling in fodder beet. Um, so we had, had 30 hectares of kale, uh, no actually more than that, we had about 40 hectares of kale. So we've actually we've dropped our crop area down to um, two thirds of the original area and producing a bit, probably similar tonnage, maybe even more, um, especially with the fodder beet doing, if we can get a 20 tonne plus crop. Um, we also, lucerne is a pretty important part of our, our farm system um, and most of our pastures are now fescue subclover base and a lot of those are, um, are now, uh, the oldest one is a Tom Fraser um, release of advanced max P, it'll be 17 years old and still going on, it's on a dry sunny face. Can you build the photo? The photo is of heifers uh, grazing maize. Um, I don't know when it was taken, but it's um, our yield this year. Ray Moss does all our um, all our yields and um, cage cuts, monitoring, dries it down. So it's 22.6 tonne, I think it was, and then we end up actually chopping some of it because we couldn't eat it all. So in the monitor farm <coughs> program we have across FRNL, we have dairy farmers, arable farmers, and sheep and beef farmers. And one of the things we've had to convince our colleagues of is how our farmers, and it was all about diverse pastures, these systems run on diversity of pastures. Sheep and beef farmers are already doing what the rest of the industry is aspiring to. So, but in terms of your stock? Uh, yeah, well, as I said, touched before, we used to be 2,500 ewes and uh, 600 hoggets mated and trade about um, some cattle, so we were 80 20. Uh, now we're about a 75 to, uh, 25 cattle to sheep ratio. Um, this has given us a lot of more flexibility. And, and we actually grow more feed with a higher cattle ratio. The least flexible stock on that lineup are the dairy grazers, um, but they do provide us cash flow, and we have long-term contracts with our dairy grazers. So some of them have probably been, one of them's probably been with us ten years. Um, and and we really only want one, but we have got a couple. Um, so, so, so the, about probably normally 150 plus percent lambing to 165 out of, a, out of uh, just buying and replacements. But we have been buying and, um, and known tutors from, from a, a large 20,000 stock unit farm. Uh, bulls are, are red, Shirley and I red, or Shirley rears them. And we've traded lambs and cattle through the year as well. So Bill, there's three things that we've talked about that cattle have done for the resilience of your system. More profit, higher covers, and therefore you think more drought tolerance in your system. Yeah, the cattle one for me, we have, when, because if we've got higher cattle, we run higher covers. Um, and, and, uh, but it still suits us to have on our hill country and the lucerne, uh, which is all the light land, particularly for land finishing. Uh, so there is a balance in there, but I mean one of the things that we will talk about in a second is our land finishing and we've gone, I think on the next slide is it? So on the next slide, <coughs> probably some of the stuff I've talked about, but one of the key ones in here is that we've actually gone to a 60 day wean and that's, the that's since this program, probably a couple of 
a couple of drivers with that were dry, droughts, so we've done it a couple of times before. Now it's sort of um, almost, nothing's, nothing's fixed, but almost standard policy is 60 day wean because we've got the lucerne, we just wean everything on. Well, that, most of the lambs will be on lucerne prior to weaning. Uh, we can get rid of cull ewes, it freezes up because we end up having more dairy grazers in come in December, calves, and remember we're summer dry. So we put a lot of pressure on our systems during the summer, and that's why we're growing some of the feed crops we are. So what else did you want to learn on the, the yeah, no, that's, that's right. key. So what we want to move on to now, so Bill's given us a snapshot of the farm. For those of you who also undertake overseer modelling, you'll appreciate the challenges we have in producing overseer models for a farm like this. Um, it's complex, it has a lot of trading and makes a lot of, a lot of decision changes. So it hasn't been easy for our team, particularly those assumptions around the profit. You know, is Bill going to take that crop through to grain? Is it going to be silage crop, etc.? That photo there is actually um, one of the very, very light land paddocks and it was a pain in the bum. It grew, grows every weed under the sun apparently. The, the neighbour told me the other day that the previous owner used to take his motorbike and he didn't need to put the stand down, he used to park it against the nodding thistles, <laughs> <laughs> um, which were like this and, um, and many other weeds. But this is a Derek Moat designed crop, uh, lucerne. Um, coxfoot and the coxfoot, the idea of the coxfoot was to compete with the weeds and it does that. I mean, we've got hoarhound, we've got nodding thistles, we've got everything else. I swear at it every year, but it grows a bloody lot of feed um, because the coxfoot sort of dominates quite a bit now. And it was only sown at one kilo into an already established lucent paddock. Um, and it's just, I, yeah. I don't want to go back there too often because there's a lot of stones under there. Um, but it does the job. So. Okay, so we're just going to quickly now go through the results from the modelling work that we've done with Bill and Shirley around nitrate leaching. So what we did was started by saying, well, what's the baseline nitrate leaching on this farm? And Bill and Shirley really didn't know. Four years ago, they had a sense the nitrate leaching wasn't particularly high, but they hadn't done the numbers at that point. And then look at some of the options we've explored, and then we'll have a quick look at what the science is telling us and where that may or may not offer us an opportunity for our sheep and beef farms. So we started by looking at the baseline for this farm and it came out with a baseline nitrate leaching of 17 kilos, which is probably what a lot of you would expect for a farm like this that's running a lot of stock, growing as much feed as it can within the environment. So when we set that farm profit at 100, then we said the target for this research program is 20% lower nitrate leaching. So yes, we could take 20% of nitrate out of that system and that thing what we call export crops. It killed our profitability because it cost quite a lot of money to load 54 truck and trailer loads of forage and ship it down the road to the dairy farm. So when we took what <coughs> Bill and Shirley had available to them, what we found, and, and there'll be no surprises to, to most of you, it was difficult to lower the nitrate leaching on this property and still maintain profitability. Yeah. This is the process you went through before you um, changed the stock policy bill. So is this with your thousand years or is this with your 2400 years? This is the thousand years. Okay. This is here and now. Okay. This is here and now. Here and now, so 75% cattle, a lot of winter feeding, hence this number. We'll show you the one other way to reduce in loss. Yeah. So bulls on crop. So we but what we did challenge Bill and Shirley with is our modelling suggests that you could do better with the performance of your animals on fodder beet, and that was a lot about how they used their lucerne with the fodder beet. And secondly, more lucerne and tall fescue in their system. And that, as you can appreciate in the summer dry, is a lot about where you get that shoulder of the season feed supply. And they're things that Bill and Shirley have been actively working towards. So how do you get 20% reduction? Bill and Shirley could deliver what we couldn't deliver. That was 2015. They did it. Bill, what happened in 2015-16? Um, I think we had 17 inches of rain that year, which I'm not sure how many millimetres that is, but it sounds a bit more in millimetres. sounds about more in millimetres, actually. Um, so, I mean, a drought year. But the lessons um, over, and, and going right back to our monitor farm days, the lessons we learned in the drought years, because in the monitor farm days, 96 to 99, four years of monitor farm, we had three droughts and, and um, we had covers of less than 500, which is about the carpet. Um, but the lessons we learned from that is protect next year's income. And, and our key stock 
because uh, the dairy grazers are one of those as well. Because if we send them home to any one of you, I won't get any back. And that happened a couple. Of, that happened in that year. Many many farmers sent them home, ran out of feed. We can't afford to do that. So our key stock, um, you know, it's our bulls go early, our lambs go stores. Um, our ewes are flexible because we buy and we're not breeding our own replacements. So we didn't buy and we bought in this set of buying and autumn ewe fairs or at that time we buy in the spring uh, as in lamb ewes. And, and all those systems um, sort of affect the bottom line. And I mean, it's not a profitable year. So we said you made it all? Yeah, I think we did make it. I think it was about, a, it was about break even. But the next year we were back up and flying. And I mean, the lessons learned is that if we'd had a breeding ewe flock and I'd and as many did, culled the ewe lambs hard or, or got rid of the whole lot, it's five year breeding program to get back. And in our environment, in many environments, you guys get dry up here. Five years is probably another adverse event in that time. So the key lesson is protect next year's income in an adverse event. And that's what um, Shirley and I have taken back all the way. And in fact, brother-in-law's in South and this year have used that. And I, I was staying with us the other day and he said, will my neighbours say, shit, you got some feed. He said, I stole, sold store lambs early. I made decisions early. And that's because of the lessons we learned. So, that's so, so, so Bill and Shirley could see a reduction only when we had extreme weather events. Within their system, it's difficult to see nitrate leaching. The contrast is some of the dairy monitor farms. Because their inputs are bought in feed and nitrogen fertiliser, they have a much greater ability to look at how they change the nitrate leaching. So our first key message back to the, to the scientists in the program is there are real challenges for sheep and beef farmers when we think about meeting these environmental targets with the choices that they have available to them. And Bill and Shirley, as you've seen, because they do have put on a crop, have a lot more choices than many other farmers. So what we've seen with the kind of system they've got in place is they've built more resilience than they had when they bought the farm. They've got a lot higher yields of, from their forage crops. They've got more yield, they've got more shoulder of the season production. It's certainly brought about more intensive management in terms of how they're trading stock, how they're managing stock. And that's actually resulted in more losses to air and water. So more nitrate leached than when they bought the farm, and actually more greenhouse gases, and we'll show you that at the end. So part of what we've been doing in this program, we know on average that farm leaches 17 kilos a year. Their crops of fodder beet and uh, kale, they only make up about 5% of the farm. But, as you will appreciate when you have a, la a very large crop grazed intensively, there's a lot of nitrate leached within those paddocks. Now we've got some ranges in here because the, the nitrate leaching, as estimated by Overseer, depends very much on the rotation. And one of the things that we've been able to explore with Bill and Shirley is how some of the rotation choices they make impact on how much of that night end they manage to capture. I mean, Bill's point to us is, well, I actually want to capture that end because it is worth a dollar a kilo to me. So the maize, for example, that can end up with bare ground some years, Bill, in autumn, which is a high risk time for leaching, with no growth happening, and that's where we see the higher leaching numbers coming through. Yeah, if the maize comes off late and the, and the next crop's not established in time, it can be an order, it can be a, almost a winter fallow. So, so that's what, so Bill and Shirley, we got to this point, they understand their nitrate leaching, they understand where on the farm the hotspots are in terms of their leaching, and for our scientists, it's been a real eye-opener for them about the kind of systems we're dealing with and about the kind of limited choices that these systems have. So what's the research been about? So in combination, high yields of winter grazing and cattle, that's where our opportunity is to do something different. That's where our challenge is coming. But not forgetting, we're only leaching less than 20 kilos of nitrogen. So the research program has taken a pathway of saying the key things that have come through as real opportunities for the research to help farming is the first, species that dilute the urine. They have a diuretic effect, the animals pee a lot more, they drink more water, it's more dilute. Plantain is the model plant there that we're working with. Pastures that grow in the cool seasons, so pastures are picking that up, capturing, capturing that nitrogen that's in the system. Italian rye grass and oats, Bill, both of which can fit into your system. Italian and oats? Absolutely, yep. and, and we use a lot of Italian. Um, I, as a, as a pre-crop to our winter crops so out of old pasture and post, um, post barley or post winter feed. 
So, and sorry, the last one I skipped over, that low nitrogen crop, so we've got quite a bit. Um, what do you think of the nitrogen leaching results in overseer for the lucerne? Because it's a bit of a disincentive with the way it's currently modelled. Do you think those are Mr Derek Moot wouldn't agree with them, so I'm, yeah. on, I'm on his side. Uh, yeah. so, so the lucerne is in the list of that to be improved. Um, it's in a long list of... And, and there's some really good work being done in Taupo um, on Mike Barton's property with the lysometers. And he's suggesting five, lead, five kilograms, which that's a winner for me because we're on light soils, so. Yeah. So it's very much about the soils too, so yeah. Uh, the, we, what, the last slide about the, the fodder beef, um, didn't you just say that you had more leaching for using fodder beef off? And this is where you've got to think about it in the system. Yes, so fodder beef's got lower nitrogen, higher yielding, so what it means, the load in that paddock is quite high. Yeah. And Shirley is now saying to us, <coughs> based on what they did last year, should we be lifting the fodder beet? Should we be feeding the fodder beet elsewhere? So you're right, there's a lot of load in that paddock. So we'll take you through what we've done to look at, look at the option. The, lo the load is in that paddock, but we've actually lessened the area by a third as well. Uh, um, so, so that's significant. We've got more area in grass with less, less so in loss. More area in grass coming into spring, which is highly valuable to Bill and Shirley as well. So again, it's that complexity you guys are dealing with weighing up. Right, so fodder beet. Potential benefits, it's a lower <coughs> nitrogen feed, and yet it's still got high quality, um, high energy. Now, one of the things that some of the dairy people will say, it's been responsible for far better fed cows because we feed animals better, generally, on fodder beet than we do on kale. Because you know with kale, there's that trade-off between utilisation and intake. With fodder beet, we get high utilisation and we tend to get better performance out of the, out of the cows. So it maintains the performance, but because of the question exactly asked down here, there's nothing growing after we've taken that fodder beet off, we've left a lot of nitrogen behind, we know we've got a higher risk. So this, this is my slide, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like this slide. All I wanted to show you here was the science supports that there's less grams of N in the urine as we increase the amount of fodder beet fed. Now Sue McCourt would say, well, I wouldn't want a growing animal being fed 85% fodder beet in a cereal store. Well, she's rolling her eyes at me. Um, and that's absolutely right. But we just wanted to demonstrate, the science showed it, and to give Bill some numbers, those mean the total N going on in the urine from 70% was 248 kilograms per hectare. At 85, it was 148. So we've proven that we're getting lower N coming out. And this is on, that was on... Um on mature cows, wasn't it? So it wasn't on our farm. It, wasn't, it was mature cows, Sue, so that's our out. <laughs> mature cows need less nitrogen. Right, so Bill and Shirley can grow really good crops for fodder beet. It's highest yielding, it's low in, in the feed. We've just shown you before <coughs> I said that, but we know it's a loading issue. So what we've been doing in FR and out is looking at catch crops. And um, this probably entertains the farmers the most. This is probably where they think science is in um, dreamland a little bit. But the science data from the controlled experiments is pretty outstanding. We, they look at this, we look at measure soil mineral ends, so the mineral N available in the soil. When we, the guys compared it to fallows, so to bare ground, the oaks reduced soil mineral N by September by between 20 and 40%, and at harvest by 71 to 75%. So armed with that information, Scobie and I went out to Bill and Shirley and said, what do you think? One of the reasons we chose these guys, they said, yes, of course, we think it's a great idea to try catch crops. So we planted catch crops. Now, Bill will tell you that all we did was grow a paddock of weeds. It's actually not true. The weeds don't have a lot of dry matter. There's 85% of the dry matter came from the cereals there. So Bill and Shirley had gra did an early grazing of kale. We came in and planted triticale or oats or left it fallow. So when we left it fallow, we actually grew nearly two tonne of weeds. Yeah, so we got it some days. Where you <laughs> So the oats, and of course we can always blame Bill for the weeds, can't we? Um, the oats we grew 4.3 ton, the triticale 4.4. So pretty disappointing from Bill and Shirley's perspective. And this is where sheep and beef are different to the arable and the dairy. It's much harder to figure out how we make these. Mind you, Robin, Ray Moss, who was doing this trial, was um, digging holes to, to get this 
the soil uh, prof through the soil profile to get the, the mineral end tests, and the ground was frozen, so he was using a crowbar when he put those crops in. Ray's been a technician for 57 years. He's very tolerant of my does, does the, the nitrogen, um, does that change if we have a higher rainfall? Yeah. So, so we've got the mineral nitrogen sitting in that profile, sitting in the soil after those cow, the cows have walked off the fodder beat. You're absolutely right. As it rains during the winter, it's going to go be washed down. So we grew that. On Bill and Shirley's place, this is the mineral nitrogen at the time of harvest in November, we had about 23 kilograms of N per hectare in total. Much of it was in the below 15 centimetres. We took about 30%, caught about 30% of that in that rather ordinary crop of oats, and about 15% <coughs> in the triticale. 10 minutes, thank you. So, so we caught that. What we want to show you now is Blair and Amy Kirkland, our other monitor farm in North Canterbury. Now, there's this fodder beet bill and it was grazed in August and sown in August in, so at the very end of August they sowed the oats in Triticale. Now we might have had to sow it more than once because we might have had a bit of problems with the mud and then we got a big rainfall event but we eventually got it to grow. With both Bill and Shirley's crop and this crop we only got 15 to 20 percent of the seed was there as plants when we harvested it. And I don't know, what would you expect to get normally? If you plant 10 kilos of seed, how many plants are you saying? Well, if you're planting barley in the spring, you're about 80%. 80%, right. So, what would you say then? Just saying you wouldn't plant that late that, at that time. At that time, exactly. But to try and capture it as a catch crop, we need to try and get it in the ground as soon as possible. But so, Blair and Amy's, you know, we, st we had 50 kilos of burn in there, so that bottle beet had left a lot more nitrogen in the system. <coughs> Ramos has to eat his hat because we ended up with 10 kilos and Ray was convinced we wouldn't shift any nitrogen because the conditions were so challenging. We ended up with 10 kilograms of mineral N in the oats and about 25 in the triticale. We've only just got these results so we haven't had a time to walk through them except Bill will talk at the end about what we're twisting his arm about next. So showing some real promise but the difficulty for sheep and beef Bill is how do we make that catch crop into something that pays? So here's the catch crop on the 10th of no November, and here's the fellow next to us. So yeah, we did grow good weeds. So the question that Bill went back <coughs> to us with is, does my spring sow and barley count? Does that work as a catch crop, and will I eventually be able to claim that in overseer as having reduced my nitrate leaching? So the, one of the questions we have to know now is, how early does he need to plant that how, how long has he got before that nitrogen moves down through the system? And I guess, Bill, that's some of the data we will have to get to see. Because what's the earliest you think you've got to get to yeah, the other, The other thing, and I haven't put this to Robin, but so it might catch it, but this, this particular paddock, this um, trial work was done on, was at X lucerne, a run out lucerne paddock. It's probably why it's got so many weeds in it. So, in theory, the end level, the mineralised end, should be quite high. Is that correct? And yet, we weren't. One of the challenges I have for for this thing, program is, or for those results, is the end levels actually weren't that high for a start, and the opportunity was around um, how much in the the, the uh, weeds took up. In that, in that, yeah, Andre. It's, it's a big comment. Oops. Uh, rather depressing thought, but if you had such a wet winter, how, how much of it actually just got driven down below thirty centimetres? Correct. Absolutely correct, Anders. And. The plant and food guys can't find our soil samples that we sent in at the day after grazing, so we could compare them with what we had at the harvest in the fallow. So you're right, that's one of the challenges. So what we're saying is we need to be able to say to Bill, here's when we think it would work, which would come exactly down to that season question. Yeah, mine's exactly the same question. How much are you losing right? You feed out for a bit for a long period of time. It's going to be losing it right from the start. So, so then, so what we're saying is, well, can we get in and put some oats in straight after you've grazed it? But then, is the oats just going to sit there until it's warm enough to grow anything? So that's some of the questions. We need a group of people to help us work with Bill and Shirley and Blair and Amy to figure out how we can make recommendations of when it will work. Because well, it's got potential. The, 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 the issue probably is that... Um, Cereals don't grow well when it's cold, 
and when it's wet they tend to drown and we planted spring barley twice and Blair and Amy's planted spring barley three times and that was in the spring period rather than straight after a crop so so the challenge probably is is how can we what what, what what's the next opportunity here are we going to look outside the square about our winter feed systems or our or our in situ feed systems total um, to minimise the end loss. If this is the challenge in front of us. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you've, you've grown your pot a bit, you know, you're a very low rainfall area. Can we extrapolate that around the country? I know I'm from Taranaki, and I do a, I've got a cross stock with a lot of uh, drilling off farm. But I've seen some horror stories of grazing pot of Cows up to their knees, up to their bellies grazing pot of They're destroying the soil structure. Yep. We had. What's that uh, going to, what we, to yep. an option? Absolutely. No, I took cattle off fed, fodder, fodder beet for three weeks last winter. They self-fed on a silage pit and I cut and carried. Well, no, I didn't cut and carried. I picked it up with a fodder beet bucket for three weeks until I can get them back on. Well, actually, they were off for two weeks. So I tried to transition them back on. Um, so, so this is probably the challenge. I mean, I didn't want to stuff my soil structure because I'd had a light land crop. That was OK. As soon as it went on the heavy clays, they were so wet. Um, I don't, as an industry, I don't think we want to be promoting fodder beet for the whole uh, of New Zealand. Because well, fodder beet, in that situation, I could lift it. So I yeah. wasn't destroying... In fact, on the soils, um, uh, when we put the cattle back in, there was far less damage and virtually no damage done to, to the soil structure. So you were able to it. in those wetter conditions. Yeah. yeah, and I wouldn't put the heavy balls on. Do you want us to carry on with the slides? Because you we've kind of got lots of questions happening. Five minutes. Do we have time for questions after that? No. Okay, let's just quickly go through the slides and then we can have a catch up afterwards. Um, alternative pasture species, so plantain, here's how much total nitrogen, <coughs> nitrate leached under a perennial ryegrass was close to 120 kilos. Under Italian, it was nearly half, but when we had Italian, Italian and plantain at the same amount of urine going on. This one here, really low leaching. The Italian and plantain grew faster and there was less nitrogen in the urine to leach. So real promise with it. Now this is the Waikato. In the Waikato, the measured leaching of nitrate from loose bill was off the scrap, under high rainfall, under off the scrap. So we did put it on here because they had a bill here. Um, but tall fescue added significantly to reduce the nitrate leaching Plantain and tall fescue are deeper rooting, so really important to Bill and Shirley's farm. So plantain at Highlands, great establishment Bill, and up until this year, after a year, Bill and Shirley couldn't have more than 10% plantain in the pasture. But this year, there's more in the pasture, Bill, because you've had a better year. Yeah, that's right, and that photo there is actually um, a drip drilled Italian uh, triticale um, with, with uh, plantain in it post barley, so barley that was headed for grain, <coughs> and that photo was taken, um, it's only just you know this high. So we need about 30% plantain to get the plantain benefit, so that's a huge challenge. So all our pastures have got plantain going, and our challenge is to maintain them, and this year we're looking more promising, <coughs> whether it's seasonal or better varieties. So Bill's talked about some of the challenges, the science knows that there's <coughs> a heap of challenges around plantain, fodder beet, and catch crops. We know we're part of the way there, but we're not all the way there. So really quickly on greenhouse gases, you guys have done a terrific job. We're down here where we would have been up there because of the gains that you've made in your systems around efficiency. It's going brilliantly. But we also know that we have an emissions profile that looks like a developing country. 50 odd percent of our emissions come from farming. So Bill's decided the solution is we're going to bring another 46 million people into New Zealand. And that will mean that we'll have a lot more energy um, emissions and so farming will I don't want to live with 46 million people, so I'm not letting them all away with that one. So we know there's a lot of international pressure. We've been privileged to have funding from, from you through MPI and the New Zealand Agriculture Greenhouse Gas Centre. So on Bill and Shirley's farm, we the farm has grown over that time. It had leaching losses of 10 kilos per hectare when they bought it. It's now at 17 unless they have a drought. Its total production has gone up substantially. This is the total amount of carbon dioxide it produces per year, 4,400. That's gone up, but the efficiency has gone down enormously. So like many farmers, Bill and Shirley have intensified their far more efficient 
and their greenhouse gas footprint is bigger. So what we know is that the greenhouse gas emissions and the air leaching are quite closely linked. Doing the basics right means that Bill and Shirley are an efficient farm and most years a profitable farm. But we've got to be always focused on right time, right place, right amount and feeding well. The longer the animals are on that farm, the more nitrates they leach and the more gases they produce. So finally, the Monitor Farm Network has been an absolute privilege for science to be able to work with the farmers to keep questioning <coughs> everything that we do, absolutely everything. To identify why things won't work and what we would need to do to make them work is absolutely key to where we're at. Um, we went out to interview farmers that met these criteria. Scobie says you go down to the bottom, Find farmers who've got great lunches and are really generous with their time. They've had to provide all of these things. It's amazing how much we expect people to be on the end of a mobile phone and they're not. And the final word is with Bill as Emma comes up the front. Over to you, Bill. Over to me. Uh, well, so, no, look, the, the challenges and opportunities going forward are immense, as we know. But, you know, we're all up for it. And, and, we, need to, and, and we need to be challenged in, in our present farming systems and improve our environmental footprint. And we, we're doing that, we're all conscious of it. And I'm, I'm proud to stand up in front of anyone and say, farmers aren't environmentalists. Our social license to operate can only be achieved through research and extension and telling our story. And Nick Beebe's part of the story that he presented through there and some of Anna's presentation, or all of Anna's presentation, but telling our story about what we're doing to our consumers, to the world, that's absolutely critical. Um, there's no one silver bullet to fix our, our environmental impact. Every action that's happened in the past, when my father was farming, they had livestock subsidies for more sheep. We were subsidised to drain swamps, to knock down bush, have a consequence. So every action that we have now has a consequence. So, and it, we've got to acknowledge and, and be aware of the environmental impact we have and that we make in incremental changes. And some of that will be through genetics, pasture and animal, and some of it will be on-farm practice. And so, but, but at the same time, we've got opportunities to be productive and profitable, and that's the, that's the key. If we're profitable, we can be green. And just that is what Bill has to do this year as part of being an FRNL, right? He's already put plantain in with the Italian, and he's about to sign up for the tweet. Right. Can we put our hands together for Dr.